Welcome everyone to day two of the Progressive Youth Forum here on Facebook Live here in the European Parliament uh, in the Vox Box. And uh, we'll be talking over the next, uh, what, couple of, two and a half hours uh, on COVID-19, overcoming new challenges to gender equality. Uh, this is ahead of Women's Day next week. Uh, and uh, this is sponsored by the uh, Socialists and Democrats group, S&D group, with a young European socialist, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the European Women's Lobby, and FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive uh, Studies. As we all know, COVID has impacted us all. But today, we're going to be talking about the impact on women uh, and on gender. And uh, this is, uh, we're going to take stock of this impact from this crisis. It, COVID is a, is a devastating killer, but it's also a caused rising domestic violence, uh, impact on pay, on the pay and the pension gap, uh, impact on employment, uh, throwing the work-life balance further out of whack. Uh, and there's been backlash against uh, LGBTQ. So this is something that we want to talk about today, and we want you involved as well. We're going to have the MEPs speaking. That's very important, but we want to get to your questions as quickly uh, as possible. There is, I might mention, there's a new e European Parliament report, the gender perspective in the COVID-19 crisis and the post-crisis period. It is essentially a call to action uh, to deal uh, with gender uh, discrimination with, uh, and, and to, I'm sorry, to empower workers to claim their right to equal pay. There's also, I might mention, this is 25 years after the Beijing Declaration to eliminate gender discrimination. Where are we now? We're still there. We're, we haven't gotten out of this. And seven years after the Istanbul con Convention to stop violence against women. Has it stopped? No. In fact, it's intensified during the COVID crisis. So this is what we want to talk about, the agenda today. We'll open with some opening remarks. We'll have a video, a panel discussion, a Q&A with you, uh, and a, a chat with the, uh, Euro, the EU Equality Commissioner, uh, Helena Dali, and reports from the workshops from day one of this forum, uh, and closing re remarks from uh, Maria Neuchel uh, of the S&D the S Coordinator on the European Parliament's uh, FEM Committee. So. Quickly, tech tips, uh, your questions. You, uh, you, since you're on Facebook Live, you can see that you can send the questions in the chat, very important. Keep your, in mind the hashtags, hashtag Youth for Equality, hashtag IWD, International Women's Day. If you hear a good sound bite, let's cast it further. And uh, the speakers, please, all the speakers, remember uh, to mute your mics when you're not speaking and to look in the camera when you're talking. And let's try to stay close to time. Let's start uh, with an opening and welcome uh, by the S&D Group President, Irache uh, Garcia Perez, Spanish MEP on the Libe Committee, the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Irache, are you with us? Good morning, Chris. Uh, good good morning. morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to welcome uh, you to the second session of this important forum. It is important because uh, you represent a new blood of our socialist family and because you are here today to reflect and give contribution on gender equality, which is one of the fundamental pillars uh, of our uh, party. Uh, and uh, this is uh, our priority as a political family and as a political group. And uh, we will uh, work uh, during the next uh, days to reinforce our position. The COVID-19 crisis is having a hard impact on women. Uh, they are in front line of the fight against COVID. And they are not only represent more than 70% of the health sector workers, uh, but they also the majority in other essential sectors uh, as education, care, taking of children and other depend, uh, persons. Uh, women are the most affected by the economic crisis created by the pandemic. They were already in a worse situation than men because women are the majority in precarious and low wage jobs, part-time jobs and among unemployment. So the crisis has only worsened the situation. This is uh, very clear when we speak about the more vulnerable uh, group, the women are the, 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 the biggest, uh, more vulnerable uh, group. The, the late estimation indicate that the participation of women in the labor market has fallen several points uh, and that the gender pay gap has increased. Even worse, the experience of previous crises show 
that uh, it is uh, more, more difficult to recover family than a male uh, unemployment. Gender-based violence has also increased because women have been forced to stay with their abusers during the lockdown. The pandemic uh, has also restricted the access of victims, victims to support services like uh, shelters and help hotlines, retrains will make it harder to leave abusive uh, partners. It is very important that all measures and recovery plans take into account the gender perspective. We must guarantee investment to build resilient societies, combat uh, precarious conditions in female-dominated uh, sectors, uh, and uh, it is very important to prevent uh, the poverty and social exclusion and also to build a robust care infrastructure. Only this way will ensure gender equality and the economic empowerment of women, which uh, will also have a positive uh, effect on the economic uh, growth. The recovery and resilience uh, facility is a mechanism uh, for helping member states to recover from COVID crisis. These resources will be allocated on the basis of the recovery and resilience plan uh, uh, prepared for the member states and approved by the European Commission. And uh, you need to know that our group uh, was leading the fight to include in this recovery plan the gender perspective. I can see my uh, dear uh, colleagues uh, Helen and other uh, colleagues uh, who work it uh, a lot uh, for this issue. And you need to know that uh, uh, in some moment uh, we were the only group who fight for this. But finally, we can say that this recovery plan includes a transversal dimension in the gender equality and will be very important because sometimes we have to think that the crisis can be an opportunity. And we have now the opportunity uh, to, to use this uh, recovery plan uh, to, uh, to transform our economy, our societies, our industry, and we have to do it thinking in the gender perspective. Only with this perspective, we will guarantee more justice and more feminist society in Europe. And this is one of the more important values for us in this moment. The European Commission has just uh, presented two important proposals for promoting uh, gender equality. The, the action plan for the implementation and the social pillar and the directive on pay transparency. Uh, now it is uh, our responsibility as a parliament to work uh, in order to improve these proposals by the European Commission. We will uh, work uh, near to our commissioners, uh, Smith and uh, Elena Daly, uh, to, to include uh, in these proposals uh, some initiatives uh, to um, support and to do a stronger uh, uh, activities uh, in order to, to guarantee this uh, equality. I am very happy to be here with you. I know that uh, this morning we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, colleagues uh, who will participate in this important uh, event, uh, but now I will finish because uh, the role of uh, the other people will be very important during this morning, and I want to listen to you. And uh, you know that uh, you can't uh, with me uh, to uh, build a more feminist Europe because that means more justice Europe. Thank you, everybody. The Thank you, Anja. Pandemic. I think we're going to show a video now. Let's uh, roll the video before we go further. Make hit women harder than men, even harder than the financial crisis in 2008. The most affected sectors are also the most precarious, and they were highly mostly women. More than 4 million temporary workers in Europe lost their jobs since March last year. Also, more than 1.5 million part-time workers found themselves unemployed. The vast majority were women. These women were working in sectors vital for our societies, such as caregivers, sales assistants, in restaurants, directing theatre plays, working as flight attendants, guiding tours through cities, running hair salons. These women could be our neighbours, our mothers, sisters, cousins. They are young graduates or are unqualified, often migrants, sometimes have disabilities. 
The COVID-19 disaster reveals the unfairness at the very heart of our economic system. Low wages, short or unpredictable working hours, low security and a lack of care services. Now that we spend most of our time at home, women are more often than men overwhelmed with unpaid caregiving and domestic tasks, and they are more than ever the victims of violence under their own roof. Null tolerant gegen Gewalt an Frauen. Wir haben ein Ziel. Wir haben das Ziel, dass Krisen gemeinschaftlich bewältigt werden, dass Krisen nicht auf den Schultern der Frauen abgeladen werden. Om vi vill reparera den ekonomiska och sociala skadorna i denna kris är det viktigt att öka kvinnors deltagande på arbetsmarknad. Kvinnors rätt till ett eget arbete, en egen försörjning. Both pay and pension gap are intrinsically linked to the care gap. What do we do about these gaps? We build bridges, binding meshes, like pay transparency, minimum wages, and a care deal for Europe. It is our plan to make minimum loans eerlijke honest loans. To make people sure about their income and their work roster to give by zero-hour contracts and to make platform makers, such the maaltijd bezorgers, gelijke rechten to give. We are grateful for the visible and invisible tasks women perform on a daily basis, vital to our society's well-being. We want this fairness and recognition to be translated into actions, not just words. We call on the Commission and the Member States to put gender equality and women's rights at the head of Europe's recovery and resilient plans. We will fight for this, not only on the 8th of March, because there cannot be fairness, democracy and equality without true gender equality. strong call to action with that video and uh, we want to get to uh, the comments uh, from the uh, MEPs. I might uh, mention you just saw that uh, Hélène uh, uh, Fritzon of um, the S&D Group Vice President, you will give a couple of comments shortly, but I also want to uh, introduce you to uh, Marc Angel, co-president of the European Parliament's uh, LGBTI Intergroup, welcome, and uh, Robert Biedron, who is vice chair of the FEM Committee, welcome as well. And uh, let's, before we go to our uh, questions, uh, let's uh, have Helen uh, give a few comments to start with, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this event and thank you to Ir Iratje for her strong speech and a special welcome to our young participants in the Youth Forum. I would like to share something that a child said when asked about gender equality. The child said, there will never be gender equality if it continues like now, that girls still have to be a certain way and boys have to be a certain way. When we discuss children or young people and gender equality, we very often focus on the future and their future. We focus on our children's lives as adults and the importance of gender equality when our children start working, become parents or in their roles as leaders later life. But what about the life of our children and young people today? Isn't gender equality important in their lives at this very moment, no matter their age? I have a granddaughter. She is seven years old. According to EGE, uh, uh, our institution here in the European Parliament, it will take 60 years until the European Union is gender equal if we continue in the current pace. That means that my granddaughter will be 67, 67 uh, years when women and men, boys and girls, have the same opportunities and rights in the European Union. Until then, 
She is at a, a greater risk than the boys and men of the same age to experience violence and sexual harassment. She will most likely earn less than her male colleagues at work, and she will probably not have the same opportunities to be part of decision-making. And this is unacceptable, but it is just as unacceptable that the boys and girls in her school will have different opportunities now during their childhood. Last year, was supposed to be a milestone year for gender equality as 2020 marked the 25th anniversary of the adoption of Beijing Declaration, as well as the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution on Women, Peace and Security. And we were supposed to highlight the progress for women and girls and speed up realization of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Instead, as we have heard, COVID hit and we are now reached by reports on existing inequalities being worsened. Gender-based violence has increased and women risk being disproportionately impacted on the labor market. We are also reached by reports that the dramatic surge in child marriage and pregnancies among young women is expected. Children appear to be less affected by the COVID-19 virus itself, but the pandemic risk having a serious impact on children, and in particular, girls and young women. We can see uh, uh, school dropouts, child marriages, uh, and unintended pregnancies. It's only three out of many consequences of the measures taken during the pandemic. That affected our children and may have a lifelong impact on the future of our girls and young women around the world. We must act now and prioritize women's and girls' human rights and put gender equality on top of the agenda. Gender mainstreaming and gender responsive budgeting must play central roles in all policy and decision making and be a top priority in this crisis. We must listen. We must listen to young people, to girls, young women and civil society organizations, representing them in response to the crisis and in all matters that affect them. They must be a part of the response as well as the solution. The ideas, inspiration and force of young people are crucial to accelerate the realization of gender equality and to build a more sustainable world. In the green and digital transition, gender equality as well as the inclusion of young people is necessary. Let us fully listen to the child. I mentioned in the beginning, the child is not talking about the expectations of women, men, but of girls and boys. And it's very true. There will never be gender equality if it continues like now, that girls have to be a certain way and boys have to be a certain way. Let us speed up and let us take this work now for women and men and for all our children and young people. So um, I'm looking forward to listen to the young people represented here today and continue working together with you for a green and gender equal world. Thank you for being here today. Helen, thank you very much. Um, I would like to actually first go to Robert, Robert Biedron. Um, Vice Chair of the FEM Committee. Uh, at this point, um, uh, there's been backlash against women's rights in member states, including and perhaps even especially in your country, in Poland. Um, how do we deal with this? Um, what are we, what's the next step in dealing with this? Indeed, thank you, Chris, for uh, mentioning the backlash, but it's not a new phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon which was created because of the pandemic pandemic provoke a tsunami of equalities, but... Of the inequalities. Inequalities, yeah. not equalities. Mm. Uh, uh, but it's a phenomenon, the backlash is a phenomenon which we see already for some time. And even at those times, we were not 
manage to properly manage with that. And my fear is that this tsunami of inequalities will provoke even deeper fears, which will uh, transform, if not managed, into radicalization, uh, which will bring terrible consequences. And uh, we can see it not only in Poland, which I represent, where you see very visible backlash uh, against uh, LGBTI rights, while the... A hundred zones, uh, cities and zones, the regions of are LGBTI free at the moment. In, indeed, 30% of the Polish territory is LGBTI free zone. You see the backlash we, uh, within the women's rights, when women uh, had more rights when entering in into EU in 2004, then in 2021. Yeah. While the hope was for Polish women and many women around uh, uh, European Union that they will have even more rights within yeah. the, uh, the EU. Indeed. So how, how is the European Parliament dealing with this? I know you had a resolution and you were a rapporteur of this resolution um, uh, uh, on the de facto abortion ban in, in Poland, that, that court I, decision. Um, what impact do you hope that will have? The, the, the European Parliament stands on the right side in this, uh, uh, in this battle, protecting the fundamental human rights and protecting EU values, the mm. fundaments we were constructing this, uh, uh, this institution. But uh, it's still uh, weaker than national governments in managing the fundamental rights. Yeah. And uh, uh, we can see it not only in Poland, we can see it in Orban, and th 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 this weakness gave strength to uh, extreme right to rise in many other countries. And this is a danger. And what I'm afraid is that this danger, because of uh, COVID pandemic, will even rise if not properly managed. That's why the initiatives of SND are so important. I think I hear a hashtag IWD in there somewhere. Um, uh, let, but why don't we go to uh, one of the uh, S, the uh, MEPs who are out there uh, virtually, Maria Nochil? Can you hear me? S and D coordinator, Fem Committee, German MEP. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear it. Is good? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. I'll be here. I'll be speaking good German because we'll be streaming in Germany. Uh, gender equality strategy. There is a strategy uh, of of, uh, of the EU for that. Um, how do you use that to address gender-based violence that's been on the uptick uh, with the COVID crisis? Um, yes, my gun. First of all, allow me to thank you for the invitation to talk about the gender equality strategy. Now, it is very important that if member states do not begin ratification of the Istanbul Convention so that we can take a step forward together, then we in the European Parliament will work with the Commission and introduce our own directive. This is one of the top priorities when it comes to the gender equality strategy. There is a time for voluntary initiatives, but if member states do not play ball, then there will be pressure brought to bear by Parliament and Commission and will have a directive on this issue. No domestic violence against women in Europe. This is not a, member, a matter of opinion as to whether member states are for or against uh, violence against women. This is a value that all women are entitled to live free of violence in Europe. Okay, and uh, another question is, you've said that you want to see, that you said that we need a roadmap from the pandemic that includes gender-specific aspects that we include in this roadmap for the recovery plan, that there be women's participation, uh, adequate women's participation in this. Can you elaborate on that? Auch dieser Teil this is also covered in the gender equality strategy. This is enshrined. So in normal times, we need to have everyone shaping 
the gender equality strategy. And in times of crisis, gender equality needs a specific focus. Think back to 2008, 2009, the financial crisis. At that point, women were forgotten, overlooked. We know that all women in Europe paid the price for the financial crisis and that should never happen again and now we have yet another crisis it's not a financial crisis it's a health crisis we get the feeling well did we really learn anything from the past we need to recognize the fact that uh, burdens are not fairly distributed in europe we need to ensure that both burdens and rewards are evenly distributed between men and women and that's uh, in the gender equality strategy there is a clear approach to the need for gender budgeting particularly in times of crisis and of course when it comes to issues such as violence i mean this is all covered in the gender equality strategy Indeed. Uh, Maria, thank, thank you very much. Let me uh, switch over here to Marc Angel, uh, co-president of the European Parliament's LGBTI Intergroup, uh, an MEP from uh, Luxembourg. And I know that uh, next week, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's supposed to be a resolution here in the Parliament voted on, on LGBTQI as a freedom zone here in the Parliament. What impact do you think that could have beyond these walls? Well, I hope this will have a big impact uh, uh, outside, and, and we're working on a big social media campaign too. I mean, it's important. Why do we have this resolution? It's a very uh, sad anniversary. It's two years now that in Poland, the first municipality declared itself as a LGBTI-free zone, and therefore, to mark this anniversary, this sad anniversary, we really want to go out and you talked before uh, between backlashes what women's rights are concerned it's the same with uh, lgbti rights in in poland in hungary but also in other countries and we have a virus the coronavirus but we have another virus which we have to combat and it's the anti-gender movement Th this is a movement which is spreading slowly everywhere and we have to combat that because uh, women's rights and uh, lgbti uh, rights are human rights and uh, and we have to defend that and as and is very strong in this okay so that, that it, it will send a message the resolution will send a message but uh, we've also seen that there are a certain bilateral aid from certain governments like norway mm -hmm. um uh Liechtenstein and others to towns and regions in poland they're cutting millions of euros in aid mm -hmm. and and in fact there's there's one town in southeastern poland that has voted to 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 now to re, to to get to to de declare that they're not they're not lgbt free, free free anymore right to to reverse the decision so do you think i mean how could that be done from a from a european level without um, how would you call collective punishment of cutting funding? How do you do that? Well, first of all, uh, the Commission already had cuts, has cut some uh, funds uh, to some Polish uh, cities uh, within the twinning uh, programs we have with other cities, but this was uh, not very big sums, and, and we are pushing now with this resolution, which is a symbolic resolution, but we want acts to follow. We want acts from the Commission to follow, to continue on the Article 7, to, con to, to launch infringement procedures, and also, this is also a wake-up call for the Council, because it's in the Council where things are often blocked. It's yeah. in the council where, where the, um, the uh, long-standing horizontal anti-discrimination directive is blocked since 2008. It's in the council where other uh, uh, gender equality uh, uh, directives are blocked. And, and, and this should be a wake-up call. And I hope that uh, also in the member states our call will be listened because our colleagues from the national parliaments have to push, the NGOs have to push, and it's a mess message also of solidarity to the activists in Poland and in Hungary and in many other countries who are living very hard times nowadays. I hear another uh, wake-up call. I hear a hashtag in there again, uh, once again, if, you, if somebody wants to tweet that. Um, let me uh, go quickly to Maria Manuel Leitão Marques, who is Portuguese MEP. Bom dia, uh, Maria Manuel. Uh, you, I understand that you have to leave uh, at 10 before 11, so that's why I want to get to you as soon as I can. Mm -hmm. um, you are, subs you are uh, a substitute member of the FEM committee. Um, and you want to talk about the digital gender gap. How do we close mm -hmm. that digi digital gender gap? 
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with uh, all my colleagues and all the people that are attending us to, to discuss this important matter. Let me start by telling you a story. Once I heard the story of a computer teacher who was very proud that all his students participate in building a robot during a class. Adding that the boys program and the girls made the robot's clothes. So in the world we want to live is the one where we teach young people that robots can be dressed by boys and girls and programmed by both as well. But we have a problem of imbalance because 1.3 million people were studying information and the communication technology in the European Union, but girls and women were the minority, representing only 17 of these students. So we, know we need to invest in education, educate boys that care. Uh, care duties, care jobs are not women's uh, jobs. And educate girls, tech, tech jobs are not men's jobs. It's not uh, in, in questions of geek that uh, interact with computers is a profession with a very important social impact uh, in, um, in health, for instance, and in other kinds of aspects of our quality of life. So if uh, we think that in the future 90% of the jobs will be digital in a certain way, uh, we cannot uh, leave uh, uh, girls and women behind when they are of, of the universe, of, of the humanity. Uh, so uh, we need to invest in education, in mentoring, showing role, role models in order to attract more girls to tech professions. Okay, let me move quickly. Thank you, uh, Maria. Obrigado. Uh, let me move to uh, Evelyn Regno. I would like to stay on time if I can and get to the questions uh, uh, as soon as I can uh, from the audience. Uh, the chair, chairwoman of the FEM committee, Evelyn Regno, uh, German MEP, uh, welcome. Uh, and uh, Evelyn, I guess you can hear me at this point. Next time, good morning. Ah, uh, super, yeah, good morning. Um, women in leadership and decision making, uh, that, that's a very key thing, not only in policy making, but also in the boardrooms. And there are uh, some countries that have uh, imposed uh, quotas to raise the percentage of women involved in the decision making. What do you think about that? And should we have one on a European level? Uh, representation matters because it shapes policy. So let's make women visible, both in politics and, of course, also uh, in the enterprises. I give you um, an example. One of my friends is on the board and leading one of the biggest Austrian, because I'm an Austrian member and very proud to be Austrian, um, uh, uh, enterprises companies in uh, Austria. So. Uh, so it's on the railway and this really a domain where it was always uh, men working there so the vast majority are men so look at these pictures we have of little boys who want to become uh, a locomotive driver so somehow it's really a man's world and then you just have on the top fantastic women two of them and they really change and make the situation really completely different in a sector that is so male at the moment. So what do they do? First of all, role models. Don't underestimate the, uh, the, the signal you send as a role model when you see there. In the technique, in the uh, classic men's domain, there is a woman leading. So this is already a signal to all of them. And then, of course, they are picking up the stereotypes, doing uh, advertisements in newspapers showing not the little bit driving the locomotive but it's a girl and say look girls this is an inspiration don't want don't you want to start to work with us too so somehow this is already uh, attracting also many young uh, girls to to jump into a sector where they haven't been before and then of course it's also and this the question of inclusion and diversity we are leading as a, a, a women's leader uh, also to uh, create something like a safe space. What do I mean with that? 
when you're just in sectors where there are men dominating, and this is in so many areas, when you show up as a leading woman, you're the only one or just two them, and around there is this atmosphere, also the culture of leading with men, you need these uh, networks. And this top down, top down and bottom up, so both. And therefore, we need this quota. Therefore, we see the successes in those countries where we have uh, binding measures and every company always has business goals. So somehow that's another business goal to say, okay, let's be intelligent and take all these fantastic uh, uh, women who are there and have their qualifications and to have the sanctions. And those countries who have all that, they are even more successfully both, not only in the diverse way, but also concerning the uh, whole uh, economic and uh, business goals they do have. So it's just only a winning situation when we have to fight against those, I mean, I just say it right now uh, in a provocative way, those elder boomers who are still running and having their old uh, stereotype uh, pictures of power in their head. So somehow it's, less, uh, it's time to, 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 to uh, change the situation and to push those members states who are still on the brakes. Uh, Evelyn, can we look a little bit more at what's holding women back? And I understand that there are a number of factors there. One is about candidate selection for mm -hmm. a position. Uh, how can that be addressed? I mean, with, uh, with positive measures. I mean, when we just have objective criteria in the procedure, it changes a lot. I mean, what's happening right now, we have these networks, these boys' networks, they are existing. That, that's a fact. And in our directive, we put it already a couple of years ago, and we're waiting, waiting so eagerly for the, uh, for the uh, countries who are still on the brakes. We just said we need objective criteria when doing the selection procedure. Nothing more. I mean, it's ridiculous when you say, shouldn't we take normally the one who have the best qualification? Uh, and in, in the normal cases, it's just somehow still on the, in the boardrooms. Do you know somebody who could be good? And it's, it's somehow it's like this. And those countries who introduced objective criteria, so concerning university degree experience and all that, somehow they changed to the better, to the far better, the quality of the boardroom. I got uh, the feedbacks from, from Italians, yeah, from Italian boards. They said, since we have a quota, since we have these objective criteria, for the headhunters for selecting uh, the candidates, we change the better the quality of the whole board. So we also get better men uh, concerning the qualification. And of course, the best one are those, like Norway, for example, who just simply say a board doesn't exist legally if you don't reach the percentage, because then it's uh, concerning civil law not existing. And this really works. I just can't tell you. This really yeah. works and it works well. I've, I've even seen statistics where, I mean, it's even less than 5% uh, in, in Japan, for instance, uh, women in the boardroom. So there, there needs to be action done in, in, in many countries. Um, if, if I may turn to uh, Helen, and, and we can talk about the, the impact of COVID on women working, and with this teleworking that we all deal with, the, the pressures on women is even more, especially if it's, you know, raising children at the same time and, and they're schooling at home mm -hmm. and then trying to work from home. How can, how can the EU help there? That's very important and we must, uh, we are both in the crisis, but we must also look for the future. Uh, we know that women are hit harder in this crisis, not medical, but uh, of all consequences in the crisis and also children. Um, but I will underline the importance to empower women is if we are going to give them uh, their own uh, work, their own job, because we can see in the European Union that we have one one third of all women, they have no work. They have no work, and they has also lost the work in this in, in this crisis. So I think it's um, my. I'm coming from Sweden, <laughs> and uh, we um, we can see in the uh, in our uh, uh, gender equality index that uh, we have the first position. We have had that sin, since since uh, 2010, mm -hmm. um, and I know how it important it is to work 
all, not only on the International Women Day, uh, all days for gender equality. And you must do it in the uh, economy, you must do it in budgeting, you must do it with gender mainstreaming, and you must, must put uh, focus on uh, why women not have the same wages and, yeah. as men, why they are uh, expressed for violence and sexual harassment, uh, it's in so high level, and um, but I think empower women with with uh, education and work and right. their own uh, power. What do you think the impact will have of? Uh, well, we haven't passed it yet, but the, the European Commission has proposed this idea about uh, transparency of of of, of, uh, of salaries and wages. Yes. Uh, how much? And by by showing more daylight on what's going on. How much, how much faith do you have that that will actually help to close the gap? I think it's a, an important tool uh, to close the gap. Uh, the, the, the gap in, in, uh, in the European Union is uh, 16%. Yes. Um, and uh, I can see in Sweden we have approximately 12%. Tw mm -hmm. So it's, it's possible if you know about the differences uh, and you can have a structure to, to take the fight. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can see it as a, as a tool to make change. Okay. I'd like uh, to invite all of those watching to send your questions in through the chat on the Facebook Live. I have another question for, uh, for Robert Gedron, and, and, and I'm an admirer of how, how you use the red couch as a mayor of Swoopsk uh, to, to talk to people. Um, uh, I, 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 it would be great to have a red couch with more people here, but we have to also social distance. So, uh, but anyway. Um, the, um, the, the, the idea that... Um, but red is close to our heart, <laughs> Okay. still. <laughs> right, right, that um, the, the, um, the, the, the Polish government has, um, has imposed this, or through the courts, they've, they've, they've imposed this, this um, um, the, the banning of, essential banning of, of, um, abortion. of abortion. How can we deal with that on a European level without collective punishment? Well, uh, we need tools and more tools. For example, uh, we need to include uh, the sexual and reproductive rights into the new EU health strategy. Yeah. But this is an issue which was not solved, not only, uh, it's not being solved not only during the pandemic, but also before. This is an issue of the style we are managing the crises, we are ma the style of uh, the political culture. And if we were to take a picture of of uh, um, uh, today's situation, we can see that the countries managed by, by patriarchal way, uh, UK, Brazil, USA, um, uh, uh, so far, they all had troubles with managing the pandemic. And the countries managed with more dialogue style, Subsk mentioned it's not a country, but dialogue style, more feminine, stereotypically talking feminine style. Yeah. Like New Zealand, when uh, the prime minister have uh, recently announced New Zealand uh, virus-free zone. I right. like that. Yeah. I wish that we, we, we lived in Poland in virus-free zone than LGBTI-free zone. Yeah. Uh, so we can see that also we need, the, the pandemic uh, um, gave us opportunity to review the way we, uh, we, we do politics. Uh, the politics of dialogue, the politics of equalities, the mm. poli uh, politics of welfare state works better not only during the peaceful times, but also during the war times, and okay. we can see it clearly. Well, I'd like to come back to that, Robert. I, we, I want to take time out for uh, the commissioner, Helena Dali, uh, European Commissioner uh, for Equality. Uh, Helena, uh, Commissioner, do you hear me, please? Are we connected? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, wonderful. Yes, I hear you, Commissioner. Yes, welcome. I um, wanted to ask you, what is the EU doing uh, to bridge the digital gender gap that we've been talking about so far, given the use of these technologies is becoming more important uh, as more women work from home? Well, that's, that's a, a very topical question, and our actions to address the gender imbalance in the digital sphere focus on four main areas 
combating gender stereotypes and promoting role models to help alter the negative stereotypes on women in tech, education and jobs. Also promoting digital skills and STEM among girls and young women, for example, through the commission's initiative, uh, Women for Cyber, or the encouraging digital entrepreneurship for, for women to facilitate access to skills, capital, and mentoring, such as through the European Network for Women in, in Digital via, via the Eurogender EU uh, portal, as well as stepping up actions on uh, combating online violence and harassment against women and girls to make the digital space uh, safer for them. Jobs in general, um, the women are uh, quite often doing the bulk of, uh, of paid, low paid or unpaid care work. How can the EU address this challenge to give women a fair economic benefits and opportunities in this sector? Well, tackling the, 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 um, uh, the gender pay, pensions and care back gap are, are, are key elements uh, of the thrive pillar in the gender equality strategy, which we presented last uh, year. Little did we know that in the meantime, there will be a, a pandemic, but it has made it even more relevant, actually. So a more equal distribution of care work needs to be put at the center of the COVID-19 uh, recovery strategies. And the swift transposition of the Work-Life Balance Directive will obviously also contribute to achieving that goal. So the experience of the pandemic, which, which uh, um, prompted many member states to introduce uh, special parental leave, for instance, and generalized flexible working arrangements should help in this, uh, in this respect. Also, so availability of affordable and high quality care systems is, is crucial uh, to enable women to combine work and, and, and family life. And investment in care infrastructure should thus uh, you know, be key within the, the gendered recovery uh, plan. Okay, what about uh, spousal abuse that has been on the upswing uh, during the COVID crisis? What uh, can the EU do about that in providing tools to, to combat that? Well, that that is something which which we have which we have discovered even more so while we were in the in the field uh, during the pandemic and and you know experiencing speaking with women who were experienced this this abuse because they were confined in in, in spaces in, with their with their you know ab abusers. So so really that's ending gender based violence is a key priority to the Commission and the EU gender equality strategy sets out a number of important actions in this area. So the, the EU's obviously accession to the Council of Europe Istanbul Convention remains our main objective, but uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, we have not managed to get all the member states to ratify the convention. And there's also talk of some member states uh, actually mm -hmm. tracking back on the on yeah. the uh, oh, for instance, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Sorry. So, so that's that's not and good at all. Family treaty. Uh, but uh, as we know, the convention offers a comprehensive legal framework to address gender gender-based um, violence. So um, accession remains um, blocked, but uh, also we are planning to we are working, not planning. We are working on our our own uh, legislation in order in order to address this the scourge of, of society okay and then and then what about getting women, more women involved in in covid related decision making for instance with this recovery plan we want to make sure that it is sensitive to 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 women right yes um we we always say that the, the more diversity of perspective there is at the at the decision making uh, table obviously the the better the the the, the plans, the, 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 the results will, will be because you have the different uh, perspectives which are contributing to a solution 
uh, we, as you know, we, there's, there's also the, the, the proposal for a directive for, for women and boards to have more women in, in decision making, which is also blocked, I'm hoping, on, on, on the Portuguese uh, presidency uh, to, to uh, work on this with us uh, as well. Um, so, so women in decision making are, oh, it's, it, this is obviously of, of the essence, especially since we are seeing during the pandemic um, that that women have been disproportionately affected, so they are best placed also to offer solutions because they they are experiencing um, different different things to to the rest of of society. So they are in a good place to to okay. propose uh, solutions. So so women and not just women, I would say, in decision making. Uh, I think the more diversity there is at the decision-making table, uh, the better our decisions will be. Commissioner, Ellen, uh, Fri uh, Commissioner Helena Dali, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's uh, move back to our panel discussion. We have about 10 minutes left, and I've got uh, a number of questions here from different people, but can we go to uh, Evelyn Regner? Do you hear me, Evelyn? Evelyn? Yes. I can hear okay. you, yes, of course. Yes. You know, what, what, can, uh, what can consumers do to drive companies toward gender-balanced uh, gender boards? <laughs> That's a good question. I love that. I mean, I think from one of my uh, one of the viewers. Yeah. Yeah, simultaneously, I'm thinking of uh, of Norway because that's always the country I really look uh, with great uh, admiration. There, they introduced this uh, state funds. I mean, that's one of the biggest funds, or I think the biggest state fund uh, in the whole world. And there, they said. This state fund financing pensions and, and, and I mean, uh, 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 the big things in the society, they will uh, only invest in the future, just working on that, if there is uh, really uh, the representation of women in those enterprises, at least, I think they're just negotiating still 30, 40%. So somehow they will just invest this money uh, if women are really represented there in the boards. And what can uh, consumers do? I mean, in Austria, for example, they can take the train uh, and uh, just uh, 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 support the gender balanced approach that are there in, the, uh, in these boardrooms. And what can consumers do as well is sometimes protesting. I just really say that straightforward uh, to, to media or in uh, newspapers, because one of the big issues in these days, especially with corona right now also, that women are pushed back against to be visible. I just uh, had my contact with journalists and they're really representative TV shows who really kick out women and more and more and more men are there. And you sometimes, we are sometimes even though, uh, aware of that. So what you can do as consumers is protesting and uh, also, um, maybe supporting those enterprises where we know here is really uh, gender balance inside. And I thank so much for the question because I just think what, what can we do in the negotiations on the uh, on the quota uh, in the in the boards with it because we should yeah. use uh, this power. It's yeah, it's about voting with your pocketbook, isn't it? The, the, the power of the purse. Um, uh, let, let me switch to, to to Mark. I've got a, a question for you. Uh, from the audience, what can citizens do to fight the backlash against LGBTQ? Well, citizens can support the uh, activists, the NGOs in the, in the different countries because uh, a lot of government funding in certain countries have been cut so they can support them financially but also f support them with action and, uh, and, 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 and protest also if marches are organized, if prides are organized, just participate. Uh, uh, you know, um, the LGBTI prides, they're not reserved for LGBTI persons, but they are yeah. open to everybody, to the family members, to the parents, to the brothers, to the sisters, to the friends, and, and there they can show uh, solidarity and protest and push their, <coughs> their, uh, their in, in their constituencies, push their uh, MEPs to, to do proactive policy and really show that there is a voice that the society 
societies gone further than certain politicians. Okay, I have uh, <laughs> barely uh, six minutes left here. Uh, I have a, qu a question for Maria Neuchel. Uh, hören Sie mich? Ich habe eine Frage für Sie. Can you hear me? I have a question. I hear to see. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. So, um, what else do you think needs to be done about domestic violence? Where do we go from here on dealing with, from a European level, on dealing with domestic violence? Well, I think that we need some good new wording on this subject, on this question of murders of women. People are calling it a femicide. And I think it's correct that we should talk about femicide. In my member state, Germany, every third day, some woman is killed through violence by a partner or ex-partner. But sometimes people say, oh, it's a family drama or something like that. But I don't think we should be uh, discussing this. It's a targeted attack on women. It is femicide. Every third day in Germany, one woman dies. And we need to ha put this subject of violence on the table properly. We need to have statistics with clear definitions. How is each crime defined in each member state? We need to harmonize this so we can get an overview. It has to be clear. We have to get a clear view. We can't allow a situation to prevail where a woman's greatest enemy is present in her own home. No, we need a definition for femicide and uh, unified statistics on crimes. That would be a big step forward. Okay, Maria, vielen Dank. Uh, can I go to uh, uh, Robert, Robert Viedron, a uh, question about, um, about women and their bodies. What are we going to do to make sure that every woman in the EU has full autonomy over her own body? Just give them equal rights. Hmm. Just, uh, you know, we live in... Uh, in union of equalities. Polish women have no equal rights with women of, uh, uh, in Sweden, France uh, uh, or Germany. Uh, and I dream that one day, uh, not only women, but all people within the European Union, we have finally equal right to decide about uh, their body uh, uh, and their life, because it's their body and it's their life. But I want to mention also the role of boys and men. This is an issue, because we are all the time talking about women. No, we expect that women will go into the yeah. boards, the women will, uh, will fight, and so Where are the men? You have to sensitize this? them, too. Exactly. It's, it's, uh, I very often hear it's not a boy's thing. Yes, it is a boy's thing. It's a yeah. man's thing. Right. And I think they're uh, paraphrasing Ma Madeleine Albright words. There is a special place in the hell for men not fighting for women's rights. Ah. Yeah, well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, let me switch then to Helen. Um, here's a question. Um, uh, what can the uh, EU and member states do to help women working in the front line of the pandemic and essential sectors like nursing, uh, care, teachers? What can we do there to help? The most important is that we support them uh, because they are doing a fantastic job during this crisis. But the supporting is not only applaud. Uh, the supporting is about uh, fair wages yeah. uh, and uh, a lot of possibilities in there uh, for these women working in uh, in uh, uh, care sector and, and uh, healthcare sector, of course. Uh, but I think also it's important to see uh, that we for the future, must, uh, we must look over our welfare system in the European Union, because if we are going to handle this sort of crisis, we must build up uh, more, uh, a, a better uh, healthcare system in all the member states. So that we can see this in, in the crisis. We have big differences in our member states. That's where the uh, uh, health union would be important, <laughs> yes. because at this point, it's, it's the national governments that are in charge of 
of that? Is there competence, as they say? Right? Yes, and, and I think it's important for, for me also as a Swede to underline that the welfare system must be a, a, a competence for the, the member state. But uh, in our level, on the European Union level, we can, uh, we can push for this, we can uh, do also things together. We can see mm -hmm. now uh, in this crisis uh, what uh, uh, procurement system and, and uh, system for uh, medical uh, instruments and so, uh, and vaccine, of course, how, how important mm -hmm. it is that we, that we cooperate on the European Union level. Indeed. Uh, very quickly, Maria, I have one last question for you uh, before we uh, go to the next part of the, uh, of the event. Uh, what can the EU do to engage more girls in the digital sector, Maria? Can we connect with Maria? Is she there? We, we have yes. two. Well, there are two Marias. Manuel. Yes, Marquez. I think yes. Ma Maria from Maria. Portugal. Yes. Yes, Maria Marquez. I'm sorry. I just I just thought about that. Sorry about that. She's okay. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, we, we don't have the connection with Maria uh, Marquez at this point. Actually, at this point, I think I should wrap it up because we want to uh, go to the to the next part uh, of our uh, event, and that is um, uh, talking uh, to uh, Zita Gurmai, who's PES Women Pre uh, President, uh, and now a Hungarian uh, member of uh, Parliament. You're the ex-Vice President of the EP of European Parliament's Women's Rights and Gender, Gender Equality Committee. You're now on the Global Progressive Forum Project. Um, Zita, can you, uh, you, you have some, um, you'd like to uh, give a few opening comments before we go to these uh, sum ups of the three workshops that we had yesterday uh, on the forum. Uh, Zita, can you, can you tell us, uh, maybe you can tell us how that, uh, those workshops went? Well, definitely. So this is a great privilege to be with you in the virtual sphere. Uh, dear Mr. Burns, hello, everyone. You should know that uh, PES Women is a natural ally of uh, the SND. And of course, for the last six years, we have been working absolutely actively together. And of course, uh, PES Women believes that uh, to cooperate uh, with, uh, with the different organizations like the Young Progressive Feminists around uh, the International Women's Day is absolutely crucial. And of course, it has been almost a century since socialist women became uh, the so-called first activist to start marking uh, International and Women's Day, which we should remind ourselves. And of course, that has been the left. And I want also to take this opportunity to remind ourselves why in 2021 it is still important to talk about gender equality and women's rights. And I also would like to remind ourselves that that's already one year ago into the COVID-19 pandemic. Every life has been turned upside down. But one thing has been remained constant, the outcry of women and feminists around the globe. And of course, the pandemic has pushed many women to their limits. Women play an important role in our society, and they bear a disproportionate burden of the crisis. That's why I believe it is absolutely important what the European Parliament SND groups is uh, doing on, and, and actually Helena Daly is also on our side. But of course, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and reinforced the existing gender inequalities. And as we have uh, heard already in the first part of the conference, and I think this is something which we need to take into consideration, that who has been at the front line of the crisis? Women. They make up 76 percent, I'm repeating, 76 percent of EU healthcare workers and disproportionately work in jobs where exposure to the virus is high. And by the way, they earn less than their male counterpart. And of course, women are more likely to be uh, all in temporary, part-time, and other forms of precarious uh, employment, leaving them especially vulnerable to the economic consequences of uh, this awful crisis. And of course, lockdown measures have led to a raise in unpaid care work for women and a further deterioration in their work-life balance and mental health, we should not forget. Gender-based violence has increased and access to sexual and reproductive health rights has been deprioritized or even restricted by the conservative or even populist government like my own uh, Hungarian. 
even here in Europe, that gender equality is a fundamental value. So International Women's Day may be over uh, 100 years old, but women are still facing new challenges. We, within the PS Women, we are working hard to raise awareness about this. Together with our progressive colleagues in the European Parliament, in the Council and the Commission, and of course our member parties, we are working uh, to achieve concrete policy measures and both European and national level to improve, to, to improve gender equality in Europe. And of course, beyond effective uh, and gender mainstream policies, it is also important to challenge the status quo, uh, to establish a new narrative, to create more space and share more stories told by and for women. What we really need to work on is the context, is also to show more collective responsibility for gender equality. And it is not just a women's only issue, but for the benefit of the whole society. And we must be prioritized in our digital and green transition in the recovery plan and our vision for a social Europe. Therefore, I am happy to inform you that PS Women launched a hashtag maker come campaign, which is currently running and where we have gathered testimonies from female front right workers and pledges from the past family to make sure that women's needs and perspectives in all their diversity are at the center of decision making. Please check it out on our website and social media if you would like to join for our call. And of course, now I heard from my colleagues that there were some very, very interesting workshops during uh, yesterday about everything from toxic masculinity uh, to revaluing care, eliminating inequalities, and promoting access to services. I'm really looking forward to listening to the result of the participant discussion because I believe that what is the most important for us, that these young people understand what we are what we are working for. And of course, I really would like to leave you with a final word, thanking all my call, all my friends in the European Parliament who are great feminists, all those who are sitting at around you at the table as well. And of course, Iracha, who is a front runner of women's rights and, and gender equality, uh, our leader, and of course, Evelyn Regner, who is my neighbor from Austria. Even though the world looks very, very different from precarious years when we could march together, shoulder to shoulder, on the 8th of March, let's unite on Monday on International Women's Day. Let's demand to make women count in 2021 once and for all. So thank you very, very much. So let's make the change as socialists and Democrats and PS women, FEPS and all our natural allies are on. Thank you very much. Zita, thank you very much. Um, hang on one second. I, a quick question. Uh, you are in the Hungarian parliament. Uh, we know uh, that uh, the situation with, uh, with uh, Mr. Orban is, is not easy uh, for the European Union. Uh, how do you deal with that uh, regarding women's rights, re regarding LGBTQ uh, in, uh, in Hungary as a member of uh, the Hungarian parliament? I can tell you it's an ongoing fight. Of course, we are the only country in which uh, in the government you find only uh, three women. This is a parliament and you find only 10 percent women, which is uh, which is absolutely disgusting. Uh, but of course, uh, Orban uses this crisis for making a worse politics for his family uh, and for his friends. You know, he used the EU funds not for uh, helping uh, for to, to get a proper uh, recovery plan, but he's helping friends, you know, to to be even richer. So we had a lot of problems during the crisis. And my party, the Hungarian Socialist Party, has been at the front line because we believe what we need to concentrate on, how to give the greatest help, how to get the best recovery policy. But the problem is Orban is just thinking about, uh, about uh, himself. And of course, we need to change uh, the Orban's government in 2022. And I'm really happy to tell you that the opposition is united. So we have a good chance to be rid of Orban. Thank you. Zita, thank you. I'd, I'd like to go further on that, but I need to move along. Uh, let's uh, go to the workshop one, uh, Collective Engagement for Gender Equality, Building Allies to Overcome Discrimination. And the uh, rapporteur, the person who is going to tell us about that, is Katja Ziska, uh, the PES Women Coordinator for Germany. Uh, interesting, I saw that you worked uh, for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation uh, in Mexico City in the scope of trade union and women's rights. 
that's quite interesting because this is, of course, uh, an issue that goes way beyond uh, the EU borders. Um, Katya, how was the, the conversation uh, about this issue uh, during the workshop yesterday? Thank you, Chris, uh, for giving me the word. Um, yeah, I wanted to give you a little bit of overview of what we have done yesterday in our workshop. Um, with the help of the facilitator, Alan Ali, who is the president of MAN, a Swedish NGO. Our workshop aimed at engaging our participants in a conversation about gender equality, um, how gender equality can benefit men and women alike and uh, those societies, the society as a whole. Uh, we want to see how, how to build an allyship and how to encourage men to become feminists and an active advocates for gender equality. And I think I can also refer what has been said before when Helen Fritzen mentioned that uh, boys and girls need to be in a certain way and this fits exactly, uh, exactly in what we have discussed yesterday. Also, um, that we have our male allies sitting around the table with you and with Mark and with Robert. Uh, and um, what Maria Neure has said earlier about uh, that we need a new wording on gender-based violence and um, um, also new leadership. So we talked about yesterday also about a, a collective responsibility uh, and how we need a collective outcry together as a society for gender equality. And, I just want to give an example, for example, uh, Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain, always calls out every femicide in the, in, in, that is happening in Spain on social media. And I think this is great leadership that uh, only together we can uh, spotlight this issue. And um, yeah, but for the workshop now, what we had yesterday, um, so we, we looked at the society's rigid messages uh, about how men and women should behave and be. Uh, and that seems controversial in the, in the context of International Women's Day, but we all know that gender inequalities are rooted in gender norms and stereotypes and in patriarchal behavior. Um, so by understanding these patterns and by collectively challenge, challenging those stereotypes, uh, how men and, and men and women are supposed to be, uh, I think we can make progress. Um, so Ellen presented the work of MEN, uh, the NGO in Sweden, who works on questions around masculinity, manhood, norms, gender and feminism since 1993. Uh, and today they have over 2,000 members and 25 branches in Sweden and um, where they set projects, uh, pr uh, set up projects on these topics. Um, Based on a video that we analyzed, uh, we talked about the concept of the man box. So um, the participant discussed the social constructs around masculinity and how we became we, we become victims of our own ideas uh, by accepting or rejecting certain attributes in, in this box. Uh, so you can see also how we deal with this yesterday in the workshop. Um, if we look closer at, on the study of the man box, uh, that was issued 2017 by Promundo, we see that uh, some men are able to reject negative social pressures uh, related to masculinity, uh, but that many do embrace these pressures and rules. Uh, there is, for example, strong support for toughness and repression of emotions. And um, following the debate, uh, participants were asked about the norms and expectations that surround themselves in their lives. So we went to the group works um, and indeed there are similarities and differences uh, and they range from pressures not to show weaknesses or emotions to physical appearances that are expected from society or not for, for not being a difficult woman. Um, so it became clear that norms are controlling us and that there's a strong need for re-evaluating re them and to expand our own boxes. Um, this is only the tip of the iceberg, um, but it, uh, if we start from an early age on and challenge these norms and have regular conversations um, on how to change and expand those norms, we can trigger a more collective approach and responsibility for gender equality. So if you think now, why should men be involved? Um, the answer is why not? Um, if men are aware of their privilege and they can use it and they can create change by stretching, stretching those norms. Uh, and so it's time for men to participate and engage in gender equality equally as women, take responsibility uh, for their own sake, not for women, but for their own sake and for the society as a whole. 
um, and it's time for them to take up, for all men to take up the fight for, femi for the feminist cause, as we women have fought for it for a uh, long time, uh, and we need the allyship. Um, not because just they have daughters, but for their own good. Um, so, so we want to hear some new stories and create new narratives around the topic and around masculinity and feminism and gender equality. And yeah, we had a really good conversation about this and I'm, I, I hope the participants enjoyed it as well. And I give it back to you, Chris. Okay, well, thank you, thank you very much. In fact, I, I, I have to, uh, we, we must thank uh, Robert Beadron for being with us. He had to leave a bit early. It uh, would have been great to ask him about this about this workshop, but maybe I can I can um, uh, I can move to Marc Marc Angel because um, th the idea of, of, of masculinity about gender that that kind of thing it does uh, affect what you're dealing with as well as as well as it, it, with the intergroup of LGBTQI of stereotypes of roles of uh, from from what uh, we heard just now uh, w what do you think what what reactions do you have I saw you feverishly taking yes. notes there so well first of all I think this workshop and uh, what we were explaining now was very interesting and I can uh, and uh, they spoke about patterns and understanding patterns but it also we have to change some patterns patterns and there I, I agree that we have to start that at a very early age to change this uh, these patterns and expanding our own boxes. That was set too, and I think yes. this is the direction we have to go. We said uh, before we talked about empowering women. We all we also have to empower men, but not to be stronger because women become stronger. That's not uh, there is not uh, the power. It's not about men have to be afraid of, of, of empowered women, but we have to empower men in the fact that we educate them what equality is and why life is better if everybody is equal. Uh, and, and I think this is very important because every man has a mother, every man has female friends, has sisters, uh, cousins, female cousins, and, and you know, uh, and it's not nice if you see that they are harassed. It's not nice if you see that they are uh, victims of, 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 of violence, etc. Yeah. So empowering men doesn't mean making them making them stronger because women become stronger, but making them understand that they are equal and that women should have the same rights as them. And allyship was mentioned too. It's very important mm. that we have men on board uh, on this Indeed. because uh, uh, otherwise it's, it's not functioning. Yeah. And it's this generation we are talking now. It's you g girls and boys and, and young women and young men mm -hmm. who, who are doing the change. And I don't want that we have to wait 60 years. Helen said it, 60 years until we have equality in Europe. This cannot be. And it's you who have to make this change that this comes quicker. And it's, it's you. Uh, and I, I'm so happy when I see a lot of young modern couples where they live equality. And it's so wonderful to see where they are not in these stereotypes. One evening, the the, the 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 men cooks the other evening the woman cooks laundry is shared all this this unpaid care has to be shared too and then we reach equality and i think that's very important helen uh, some reaction to that uh, also in mind about the about the beijing declaration being 25 years old i mean how much can we uh, help to uh, to create this collective engagement to motivate and mobilize we can't wait. We must start now. And I think even if the crisis, uh, it's very hard and, and it's hit, it hits us uh, all the time, we must think about the future. And I think it's important when we start uh, the future uh, that we, uh, we, we must build a new economy. And the new economy must be a green, sustainable and gender uh, uh, equality that we can see there that we uh, take together all these important values um, and start building a new, stronger Europe. And I will agree with Mark, because I think I always say that it all, all this starts from the beginning. Uh, when a baby is born, they know nothing about differences. And if we start early uh, mm. in the school and in, the, uh, in our societies, working with values and uh, against norms that we don't, don't want to have in, a, in, a, in our society, um, and we do it in a proper way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think an, a very easy line is if we can, we can learn every child that your name and your body, that's your own. Mm -hmm. 
Good. If we have any uh, comments or questions from uh, the uh, Facebook viewers, please let us know. Uh, send those to us, and of course, hashtag uh, I, uh, IWD. Um, Maria Neuchel, uh, if you can hear me, um, what reaction might you have from uh, what Katja Ziska told us about that uh, first workshop? Maria Neuchel, are you with us? Okay, perhaps we can uh, move to uh, Evelyn Haig now. Evelyn Regna, are you uh, connected with us now? Chair of the FEM committee. If I'm gonna ask you the same thing, the reaction to uh, Katja Ziska's uh, report on that, uh, the first workshop. Are you with us? Okay, May and let me come back to Katja. Uh, Katja, um, the, the man box, can you go a little bit more into detail? You held up the man that, uh, the, the post-its on that. Can you explain that a little bit more about the man box? Do you hear me? Yes. Um, so it's very, it was very simplistic yesterday because we only okay. had just one hour and we, it was, we touched the surface on the man box. It's a, it's the study that, uh, you can also read up. Uh, but practically what we did is the white paper as the box and we wrote down on the post-its what are the norms and expectations that surrounds each of us in, in our daily lives and in society and how they control us uh, and then discussed in the smaller groups. Uh, and it was interesting how um, there were a lot of differences also between the male and the female participants and how there were similarities and uh, but also um, there were also yeah were how sometimes you didn't think about certain things that are so um, evident uh, that are controlling you that are so normal in our society but are holding us back at some point and um, it, yeah. I think it, it would be good for everyone to to think about the norms and expectations that surrounds us uh, and uh, reassess um, how, how they are um, good for us and for society. Um, okay. Yeah. Good and another aspect that you, you mentioned was about femicide and we've seen that groundswell of of support protesting in, 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 in Spain, I believe I saw that recently. Um, can you go a little bit more into that and how we can mobilize the, the general population against that and building allies to overcome that? As I already said earlier, I think speaking out up from a really high level is important because um, um, it needs to be a top-down approach next to the trickle, uh, the bottom up that already exists because there is an outcry from the movements movement from the civil society and i think the leadership that also our political family is showing is very crucial we had we had also uh, big com um, conferences in november around the international uh, day for the elimination of violence against women and uh, we are constantly speaking out about this and we need also the proper policies and we are still having countries that don't haven't adopted the istanbul convention what is still the the best yeah. gold standard uh, to fight gender-based violence and i think we really need to move forward in it, on this and commissioner dali has already proposed uh, some uh, additional measures to tackle this mm. Okay, Mal Malcolm Angel, you, you wanted to elaborate on that. Yes. Uh, this is not, not only against women, it's against all genders, right? I mean, if you read the Istanbul Convention, there is nothing uh, where you could say, I'm against it. And yet, uh, there is opposition to it. And also because this word gender is in it. And what is even more dangerous is that two countries, Poland and Hungary, are very involved with the anti-gender movement. And they are working on a family, international family treaty. There was the Geneva Consensus signed in October 2020 with the Trump administration. Trump was very active in this too. Thank God now uh, uh, President Biden is there and it was this uh, consensus declaration was taken off the State Department website yeah. and I hope they lost an, an important ally. But there is a movement to create like a counter uh, uh, Istanbul Convention and, and that's a scandal and we have to fight this uh, uh, movement very hard and uh, we have to promote this Istanbul Convention because it's, yeah. it is utmost important to protect our girls and our women against uh, domestic violence, but other uh, violence and also sexual harassment. What's the next step in trying to get this convention ratified EU-wide? What do we do? 
Well, uh, I think we, we need civil society and we need, we need the European citizens, men and women, pushing in their countries. When they vote, take, please uh, read the programs of your parties. See if they uh, have a, a big uh, a chapter on equality, if there is feminist representatives uh, who, who push this dossier, because it's, again, here, this, this dossier is blocked also in the Council mm. uh, very much that the EU should ratify it. And then um, and, and support movements who, who are fighting uh, for these ratifications, and just okay. and, and educate people about. It. And if you meet people who are against it, explain it. Read 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 the convention with them and okay. ask them what is the problem, because there is no problem in it. It's something which everybody should uh, adhere to. Uh, Helen, how uh, continuing with that? I mean, how what is the next step? Do you think that, that, that should be taken in? in getting that Istanbul Convention ratified EU-wide. How much collective pressure can we do? Yes, of course, we must uh, we must go on and push for it. And we also have, from the European Parliament, we have had a discussion with the Commission, because uh, the Commission can take an initiative and uh, come mm. with a proposal. Uh, and if we have a proposal, uh, uh, so strong as the Istanbul Convention, we can can uh, take it <laughs> that way. Maybe uh, that's a solution. Okay, uh, catch out. Any any further comments before we wrap this up and go to the next workshop? Um, uh, d do you think the uh, the workshop should be um, expanded next time, or or uh, can there can there be a, a different approach on this? De I definitely. I think everyone should should have such a workshop and specifically um, um, companies and parties uh, I'm we are all for it that everyone should um, deal with gender equality topics because it affects every one of us it's, it's not a women's only issue we always say that in past women you can also see we have created a language style guide uh, where we also recommend how you deal with communication uh, that is gender inclusive uh, and uh, we have also done a briefing on the Istanbul Convention, but you can also ask our president, Zita Gomay, who is a rapporteur in the Council of Europe about the, this file, um, how to move forward on this. But when we talk about the workshop, uh, it was really interesting. And uh, I think uh, people should uh, reach out and make sure that and reassess their own um, um, behavior and see uh, in every co company culture. It's very important, I think, to move forward on uh, ending discrimination and gender equality. Can I can I uh, flash back to Mexico City? <laughs> you would what did like you to. learn from that? Yeah, what did you learn from that experience uh, about dealing with trade unions and women women's rights? What did you learn from that? Oh, I've learned a lot from that. Um, it's it's a different context. Um, uh, you you must uh, see we're in a very different country, a different culture in Mexico, um, much more patriarchal, uh, much more gender-based violence on women, less social rights. Um, so it was definitely interesting to, to work uh, on this and how to um, engage uh, with trade unions who are representing, for example, domestic workers who are have, where, where this is a vast... Um, very big uh, group of um, of uh, workers in Mexico, and how to uh, em empower them to have more rights. Um, it is interesting how um, feminism uh, is a very strong attitude uh, and is becoming more stronger also. Uh, but I I also um, took took our my own privilege from this experience. Um, uh, and I think this is something that fits with the workshop, um, that everybody needs to be aware of its own privilege and how to channel this to empower others. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Zita, Zita Gormay, uh, you wanted to comment on this, PES uh, Women President? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, I was the rapporteur on the Istanbul Convention in the Council of Europe General Assembly, and I'm also the general rapporteur on, on violence against women. The problem is that uh, the Istanbul Convention is going to be 10 years old in May, and thanks for the Portuguese presidency, they are really going to celebrate. 
but sorry to say it's very difficult to celebrate. Meanwhile, some countries like Poland or Hungary who are really blocking uh, the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. So that's why, sorry to say, we need to change this populist government because otherwise they are never going to ratify. The Hungarian National Assembly, there is a tiny party called Christian Democrats. This is a satellite party of uh, Fidesz. You know, uh, they, they created a, 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 a resolution in which uh, we voted that uh, uh, we should not ratify the Istanbul Convention. So they are really trying to block it. And I can tell you why they block it. Because they hate the word gender. They, because they believe it's not normal when there are different people in uh, and different problems. And let's see what happened during the pandemic, that, you know, uh, they, they uh, uh, attacked the trans people. So that was the hashtag 33 campaign for which I'm, I'm very, very thankful for my friend uh, Mark and, and Robent and all, all the other uh, women all around and, and the Rainbow who who has been a great help for us. So I can tell you, during the pandemic, and uh, now Helena Dali is launching a consultation uh, uh, what about the growing uh, harassment and violence against women? I asked the question in the parliament. I, I asked, uh, and I, I also um, uh, did it in written. And the reply was a populistic reply that we don't need consultation. So the consultation that Orban is launching is a consultation because he can get the reply that he wished for. But the real consultation for which is burning people, you know, they are simply don't care. So we really need to change this government into progressive to make sure that the life is better for women, especially during the crisis, for which I am super thankful all the women all around Europe who has been the front runner of the crisis. And this International Women's Day, we should dedicate to these people who has been doing an amazing job. Well said, Zita. Thank you very much. Let's let's move on to it's time to move on to the workshop two towards a fairer care focused Europe. And the rapporteur for that is Barbara Helferich, uh, FEPS FES Care for Care expert. Uh, one of the five founders of the Gender 5 Plus. Uh, that's a Euro uh, European feminist think tank uh, in Germany. Barbara, welcome. Yeah, hi, Chris. Um, welcome and happy to be here. Yeah, tell us about the, the workshop. How did that go? Well, a very interesting workshop because we've been working on uh, uh, looking at the care systems in, in the European Union and what the EU could do uh, to address the, what we call the care crisis. Uh, most importantly, uh, now, looking at the pandemic and the crisis has brought to the fore really the, the incredibly important role that women play in the care sector. We've heard from Zita, 76% of European care workers are women. Uh, globally, it's about 70%, uh, and women perform so much more unpaid care work than men do. The estimation is about four point uh, four and a half hours per day care work that women unpaid care work that women do, and to compare to one point uh, one point three um, hours of that men perform these kinds of, of 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 unpaid care work. So there's a big difference, a gender difference, but there's also a difference in terms of the situation that women find in the care sector. We discussed that. Um, it's it's the most feminized sector, as I said. It's the most it, working under very difficult condition, in particular domestic care workers, uh, not being covered by by union protection in in in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so we've we've heard the 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 uh, the incredible pay gap. So uh, underpaid, a feminized sector. And a very, very important sector for Europe, in particular, particularly now, as we see uh, during the pandemic. So we dis discussed all that. And what was really important in, in the workshop was also that uh, we heard testimonies from, from care workers ac uh, across Europe and actually how they experienced their, their particular um, the working, working conditions, uh, uh, pay, and, and obviously, um, looking for some policy responses to address that uh, the, the care right. crisis. What we were trying to do, um, and I, I, I think rather successfully, is to look at what can Europe do, what can the European Union do to address the care crisis, and, uh, and how gender equality actually can, can, uh, can help to, to address the crisis. 
there was uh, some criticism uh, uh, about the new gender equality strategy of the European Union, uh, addressing care only in terms of provision of care, but not really placing care in at the center of economic activities. And uh, contributions were rather clear, saying we need to use uh, macroeconomic instruments to address care, putting care at the center of the economy, and, and putting the social uh, ahead of the economic, that is, the economic policy should really serve social policies, and that we really need a care revolution, addressing care uh, in, in a more structural way, addressing structural inequalities, mm. uh, not just addressing the, the provision of care, but also addressing things like uh, the gender pay gap, in, in, in particularly in the care sector, uh, investment in care, social investment, uh, investment in, in public infrastructure, including investment in crashes. And we, we presented a 10-point plan, uh, what Europe, what the European Union can do to, to address it. And that plan really based on the principles of a people-centered approach. So there, there was strong uh, support for that. It needs to be an intersectional approach that needs to take account of <clears throat> Uh, of, of, of different conditions that uh, that women in the care sector experience, uh, and it needs to be address all phases of of of, of life. Uh, it yeah. needs to pay attention yeah. to that. Yes, Barbara. In fact, that, that's interesting. You mentioned that that ten point action plan because I, I I've read about it. And I see that one of the provisions in that action plan is care checks that you need care monitoring mechanisms to be included in um, in impact assessment when you're talking about new legislation. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It kind of refers to what you just talked about there. Well, we need, we, we, we can have, uh, we, we can design policies on paper, but unless we, we look at a policy from a gendered perspective, that is said, how does the policy impact uh, the, the, the people who are actually being addressed by the policy, uh, we need to monitor, we need to monitor the, the mechanisms, what is actually happening on the ground. So legislation is being implemented and then what, what happens um, and, and what's the economic and what's the social impact that needs to be, uh, to, to be measured. Uh, and we have tools like the European semester, we have the uh, governance tools, uh, and and do, do they actually do they actually work and do, do they do they work in a positive way or do they negatively? So um, just having legislation, we know when we have yeah. an Istanbul Convention, we need to understand how it actually impacts differently on different groups in society, but also very importantly on 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 on, on gender and how it affects women and men. Differently, so putting on a gender lens when we yeah, and, design and, and gen instruments. right and gender budgeting too. That's another part of that action plan, isn't it? Yeah, like a, a, a friend of mine once said, a policy without uh, appropriate money is poetry, uh, and and that that certainly holds true unless we really invest and don't see uh, investment in social policies in the care sector and. Uh, as a social investment, we always tend to look at it as a drain, um, uh, but it is, in, in fact, it, is a, a, it can be a driving motor for the economy, and if we place care at the center of the economy, uh, we may have a positive on, on, on people, people-focused, but we also may have a, a po positive benefit on, in terms of an economic outcome. So it's a win-win situation, really investing in the care sector properly and giving it a gender perspective. Okay, there's also that aspect of self-care, isn't there, in that action plan? Can you talk about that? Uh, very important, very important. Um, we, we, we know that, particularly now during the pandemic, um, people who care don't have a lot of time for self-care. And we all need some self-care. During the pandemic, we, we, we probably understand it now better than ever. Uh, we, we, we need to care for ourselves. We need to be very attentive to ourselves uh, in order to be able to care for others. So self-care is an, is an important element in, 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 in everything that we address in terms of the care sector. Uh, Helen, initial reactions to that report? 
I think it's very important uh, because we uh, we need uh, we have our gender uh, strategy and we need uh, targets uh, because we need to achieve uh, our goals. Uh, but we also need to follow up and see where are we, what can we do better, what can we do in another way. Uh, so I think there is a there is a really point. I yesterday I spoke to. Um, Osa Regner from uh, uh, UN Women. In she is living and working in New York, and she she told me that they have a checklist, and you can find it on their website. Okay. A checklist for all uh, the governments in the whole world uh, in this crisis, because we need to to put all these uh, concrete questions to all governments. What mm. are you doing for uh, all the workers in the healthcare uh, system? And, right. uh, so we can learn from, from good examples, and I think it's a good idea. And for example, yesterday, um, I was, before I entered the European Parliament, I was a minister in the Swedish government, a, a, a feminist uh, government. Okay. Uh, so we have worked very hard with uh, this, you mentioned, and budgeting and yes. uh, gender mainstreaming. But my former colleague, she presented yesterday um, a system for all the nurses because they are doing a very important work today. And now our government will go further with a sort of certification for all nurses. Mm. So you have a paper where you have a, a paper of your competence and that will also indirect lead to uh, um, more fair wages yeah. and a better status on the, on the labor market yeah. yes mm -hmm. i think it's a, it's one example but it's a, a good one mm -hmm. and, and 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 care checking in a way governments what governments are doing right about yes. about care mm -hmm. um zita i think you wanted to chime in on this zita please uh, thank you as I'm so lucky to know uh, Asa Regner, who is a, an absolute great uh, natural ally, and she did an amazing job as she has been in the government of uh, of the feminist government, actually, let's put it in this way, in, in Sweden, from which uh, her and it's on my great uh, uh, friend is for. And I think it's absolutely important that we have an ongoing dialogue uh, uh, with the, the with you and women, and this is what uh, was, what the SND Fund Working Group is doing because I think this is during the COVID-19, and we are going to have the CSW uh, 65th anniversary. So that's why I think it's very very important what we do and what is the message for women all around globe for International Women's Day. Okay, very good. Um, yes, yes, please. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, it, it was absolutely uh, fascinating listening to Barbara and the outcome of that, uh, of that workshop, especially the last uh, part of self-care, I think is very important. But um, uh, they, she mentioned also that they discussed that, of course, there's a lot of different care systems in the European Union. And here we as socialists, we have a responsibility to see that there is a lot of public investment in, 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 in healthcare. There is a lot of public institutions, public schools, uh, public uh, this is very important, and this, this um, neoliberalism, which was a bit a uh, tendency in Europe, we are always countering it, and we have to even counter it more. I think that is, is very important. And then Barbara also mentioned intersectionality. I think this is very important, too. We have uh, yesterday also Helena Dali presented the disability strategy, and here again we can do parallels uh, with the gender equality strategy, with the LGBTI equality strategy, so intersectionality is very important. And I I was very happy yesterday when uh, Commissioner Nicola Schmidt came to the EMPL Committee in the European Parliament and he presented the um Action plan uh, for the social European social uh, the, the European pillar of social rights, and he underlined a few times the gender dimension of this action plan. And I was really happy that he insisted so much on that uh, because uh, mm. uh, this uh, public investment, this social investment we have to do and this translating the European pillar of social rights into real actions, we have to focus on the gender aspect in it. And uh, I'm happy that the Commission is aware of that and the European Parliament, of course, will support that and we need the allies now in the member states yeah, too. In, in fact, when you're talking about uh, investment, I see on the 10-point action plan uh, for a European care economy that, uh, that Barbara was talking about, investment and gender-proven public infrastructure, including creche, care facilities, or services for elderly family members and family members in need of care. So these are things that, uh, that I guess, the EU should be helping to encourage this, as perhaps as part of that recovery plan, because we're investing 
in recovering yeah. And this should be part of that. The right? commission has to be very careful when member states send in their plans, how they will spend their money, that the money goes in this uh, direction. There is enough social investment and social investment, of course, with the gender perspective always. Indeed. Evelyn Regner, uh, can we hear from you about this? <laughs> Just a few words of question to you. So, of course, definitely um, the care deal for Europe, that is one of the major outcomes uh, of the report we have here in the, in the FAM committee on the effects of the corona crisis on women, so a care deal is of utmost importance uh, because women are, and, and it's also of great importance in order to reduce the gender pay gap because of this additional work or this, this care work women are doing, they are pushed into part-time precarious work uh, models because otherwise somehow time's running out. So it's really one key instrument. And my question right now is because yesterday we had this very beautiful formal uh, session in, in, uh, in, in, in the parliament um, debating with fantastic scientists also what can we do. One of the major outcomes is to, uh, to increase the number of men in the care sector, so childcare, healthcare, so all elderly care, all this. So somehow where we are, we are lacking women in the leading positions of companies and at the same time we are lacking men in the whole healthcare sector and the childcare sector because of course role models that mean also, uh, uh, also role models in these areas. And therefore I just simply would like to give the question back to you. Uh, how to, to achieve this, how to go there, because I think that that's one of the keys. Okay, who would like to answer that? I see, I see you nodding there, Mark. Maybe it's the other way around, as we had the discussion with IT and uh, uh, where we need role models. We, we need uh, more role models also in, um, in, in, in this sector. Yesterday I was on a panel, in, in, uh, on a, a Luxembourg panel with our Minister of uh, Equality, and there was a, a young man who is the director of a crash and who works in a crash, mm. and he said there's still some parents they are surprised when they have to give their baby to a man and they, f they mm. feel uncomfortable. No, they shouldn't. And, yeah. and this is where we have to, to, to change the, 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 the norms and also the perception sometimes of things. A, a young man can take as good care of your baby in a crash as, as, as a woman. Mm -hmm. So we need more role models and also policies to push it and to make this. I myself, I can tell you a personal experience. Please do. I wanted when I, was, when I finished my high school, I, I didn't really know what I should study, and I thought I wanted to become a social worker. But in Luxembourg, the, the term for social worker is a feminine, so it's assistante sociale. Ah, uh -huh. And I only knew women, uh, I saw, so I, and then I didn't, I was so stupid, I, how stupid I was at that mm. time, and I didn't study that. And, 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 and therefore, language, we talked about language before, is also so important. And, uh, Quite true. And, uh, and here in the crisis, I also hear often the superior jobs, I mean, the more paid jobs, they often refer to men, and then the other ones, it's, it's women. So we have to yep. pay attention to also the images well, we I mean, show on TV. In English, uh, when you talk about nurse, uh, yeah, for a lot of people, yeah, that immediately feminine. comes to mind woman, yeah, and you have, to, exactly. you have to say male nurse, nurse when it's... Yeah. When it's a male nurse, you shouldn't have to do that. Exactly, right? exactly. And therefore, yeah. language is so important. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Helen, uh, any more reaction to that? I, I think it's a. I always speak about the welfare system because if we have a, a welfare system where you can, uh, as a family, as a mother, as a father, as a child, you can feel safe because mm -hmm. you can choose to have your own work, you can have the education system, you can have a childcare system when you want to go to work um, and you can have a, a school where you work with, uh, with, with values and uh, attitudes and um, I think we start, it must start there uh, and then you can change it uh, all the way. But I will also underline that the, the most important is decision making on a mm -hmm. high 
political level uh, in, in, the, in the public sector and in the companies on the highest level, you must show in your leadership that uh, it's no difference if you meet uh, a man or a woman, if you uh, decide about wages for men or women. Um, so you must, you must do it in your own leadership and you must do it every day. Indeed. Um, can I go back to, to Barbara about this, this um, idea of getting more men involved in the, in the sector? Was that uh, touched on at all during your workshop? Are you with us, Barbara? Barbara Helfrich? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, yes, it was touched. It was touched upon, and the point was made. Uh, and and the, the the reason uh, the, the 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 sector or workers in the sector are so much underpaid is also because the the, the sector is extremely feminized, uh, and yeah. and mm. uh, it would help to have uh, more men participating in the care sector. Uh, in caring in general, uh, it would it would also help value the, the sector or give more value to the sector because, uh, unfortunately, the, the way it works in, in in the economy is the more the more women are in a particular sector, the lower the pay the the the, the wages, uh, and 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 care is an essential activity. We've seen this, we know this, uh, and still it is extremely under underpaid. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why men don't like to go into the sector as workers also, because the pay is so low. Uh, Maria Nohill, are you still, are you with us at this point? Would you like to add to that, please? Natürlich bin ich ver... Of course, I am listening with great attention. This is really a matter of uh, providing the right examples. Men need to be seen in some areas. We need role models. I would agree with everything that uh, previous speakers have said, absolutely. Okay, very good. Um, uh, let's see, maybe any uh, uh, final comment here from uh, perhaps before we go to the next workshop, um, because that, that could... Uh, entertain a lot more questions as well. Um, and if there are any more questions from Facebook uh, viewers, please, Facebook Live, please send them in. And uh, think about the hashtag uh, also, IWD, hashtag IWD, and hashtag Youth for Equality. Uh, what about the involving, um, I, I, I think in, in some professions, uh, there are not enough youth involved in, in, in these professions. Um, maybe there's something to, to, to say about the, that. Uh, uh, Barbara, did you did you discuss uh, anything about uh, youth involvement in the care sector? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is very important that, that young younger people enter the care sector. Uh, it is not very attractive because, obviously, because of the uh, the, the, the pay gap. Uh, but but it is uh, it is a sector that. It definitely needs the participation of younger people, um, a sector that is very extremely interesting. It has a broad range of uh, opportunities for young for young people, and as we go into, as we age as a society, uh, it is extremely important that young people uh, enter their enter this profession, and that's why we need policies that strengthen the sector. And, and make it into a very important, fundamental, central part uh, of our economic um, activities, uh, a sector that needs to be uh, attractive for young people. And right now, the sector is not attractive for young people. Right. So how to do that from a European level? Were there any suggestions that, uh, that, that we should do? I mean, uh, again, this care, I think, is still a national domain, isn't it? It's not a European... Uh, Competence, as they say, but uh, but what what could we do despite that? What could we do on a European level? Oh, we have we have a, we have a, a lot of instruments. We have uh, we have European funding streams, which are uh, we have the resilience recovery package, which we need to use, and we need to use it 
uh, intelligently, and we need to use it not in necessarily in, in as much in, in, into infrastructures, but we need to use it uh, to to um, to support social investments. Um, and and uh, we we need to to have crashes. We need to have uh, elderly care, uh, publicly accessible elderly care facilities. Um, we are an aging society. Um, we, we need to Im improve uh, training opportunities, in particular for young, young women. Uh, the European the Euro European funding available for that. We have the European semester. We have the Barcelona targets. Uh, in terms of providing childcare, so there is a lot of the, a lot of instruments that exist at European level, but we need to use them and we need to use them properly. Uh, and it yeah. is high time that care receives that particular attention from from the European Union level. Uh, and that means also the use of macroeconomic instruments. That means that needs a, a different tax approach. To, to care and caring activities. So uh, the, the, the 10 point plan that we have been um, uh, proposing is practical, implementable, uh, and it needs to be done quickly. Very good, Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm going to move on uh, two minutes early now to the workshop three, leaving no one behind, eliminating inequalities and promoting access to services, leaving no one behind. Uh, we'll get the presentation of the, um, of the recommendations from uh, Katriona Graham. Uh, she's Policy and Campaigns Officer for the European Women's Lobby. Katriona, I see that you are connected now. Hi, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for the invitation to be joining yeah. you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, t tell us about that workshop. What was the upshot? Uh, so it was a really interesting discussion yesterday that we had with the participants of the workshop. Um, so uh, the discussion was based on a COVID-19 report that we in the Women's Lobby produced last year, which was compiled uh, gathering input from our members all across Europe. And it was really about highlighting challenges and opportunities relating to the pandemic. Uh, we looked in particular yesterday at issues around combating violence against women and girls, promoting social, uh, sexual, reproductive health and rights, and migration. Uh, so I'll touch briefly on each of these kind of key points and some reflections that came up through the discussion. Uh, we really recognised that the EU and its member states need to act in solidarity to urgently address the surge in physical, psychological and sexual violence against women and girls in the context of COVID-19. I think we've heard a lot this morning already recognising the high impact that we've had there um, and needing to make sure that we promote the positive examples that we've seen happening across Europe, uh, such as funding increases, training, awareness raising initiatives. Uh, for example, in Austria, where we saw the Federal Minister for Women and Integration deciding to expand uh, financial support for women and girls affected by violence in times of the crisis. In Germany, uh, where the Federal Minister for Women's Rights and her colleagues uh, decided on a package of 10 immediate measures to increase protection from violence against women and girls. In Spain, there were new emergency shelters made available. And in Ireland, for example, policing services were reaching out to former victims of domestic violence to ensure their well-being uh, in this time of crisis. But we need to recognise that more can be done still. So we need to make sure all victims of violence have uh, fully funded access to uh, protection services and mechanisms that support all women victims of male violence. We need to make sure that those are long-term measures in line with the provisions of the Istanbul Convention. Uh, we're also seeking the introduction of EU legislation combating all forms of violence against women and girls, including online violence and sexual exploitation. So here really recognising that accession to the Istanbul Convention at an EU level is definitely a priority, but it can be strengthened still in parallel with the introduction of the kind of directive we've been speaking about this morning. Uh, in the workshop, we also discussed some challenges that some countries are making uh, against the Istanbul Convention and the role that the EU can play in helping us to overcome those challenges.
Um, and then in terms of SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights, under the pandemic, we saw some countries making real progress on advancing access to contraceptives and abortion, whereas others have used this as an excuse to limit services. So we saw some countries really quickly realizing the pressure on medical centers could mean reduced access to abortion services for women. Uh, so they introduced or expanded access to teleconsultations to prescribe abortion pills at home. So this would be, for example, in the UK, in France, Ireland, Finland and Sweden, whereas other countries use this as a chance to limit access to abortion services by declaring them as non-essential or blocking surgical abortions, for example, in Hungary, by forcing women with symptoms of COVID-19 to have delayed or banned uh, access to supports, like in the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Iceland and Slovenia. Uh, and of course, we've seen the terrible pushback uh, in general against women's access to abortion services in Poland, but other good news stories such as Northern Ireland where we've seen the legalization and provision of services. So it's really a twofold response that we've seen. For the women's lobby at the core, we want to make sure that access to services is maintained, whether it's in relation to childbirth, contraceptives, abortion services, or access to information, that all of these are recognized as essential health services and that the EU and member states ensure regularized health services is made safe and available for all women based on the principles of non-discrimination. So this comes into health practices as well. We need to make sure all supports are available to women despite their migration status, their legal status, whether they are victims of violence, if they are affected by prostitution, all of these most vulnerable groups need to be supported proactively. And then when it comes to migration, we spoke about how women and girls in asylum seeking centers are already being held in overcrowded and not fit for purpose facilities. That this was enhanced when the asylum application process was slowed, when NGOs were banned from accessing tented accommodation sites and search and rescue efforts were additionally blocked during the pandemic. So some really severe challenges being faced when it comes to migration for women and girls. We need to make sure that all EU member states are providing uh, health, financial and protection services for those victims, uh, for all women and girls who are in migration situations, and that those who are particularly affected by violence in temporary accommodation centres have access to recourse to prosecution of perpetration and to safety. Uh, our discussion during the workshop also touched on some wider ranging challenges in the justice system. So we spoke about how the issue of low reporting rates of violence and mistrust that reporting will actually lead to an improvement of the women's situation. It was noted that in some countries, police will actually tell a man if a woman has made a report against him. So this puts the woman at further risk. And we discussed that simply offering training and policing services really falls short of the mark. We need to make sure that training is delivered to all of those involved in the justice system, particularly at the very top of the system in terms of the judicial and that we need women's participation in senior roles and a clear no tolerance of sexism and racism, etc., to be held to be upheld in a top-down systemic approach to really shift the culture of impunity in the uh, system. We noted finally the importance and the role that MEPs play, particularly in the FAM committee, LIBA, jury, uh, in driving the agenda forward for women's rights in Europe, and that we really have at the European Union a key opportunity to make sure we harmonise policy and law so that women, no matter where they are in Europe, have equal protection, equal freedom to live to their full potential and equal access to services. So there's so many opportunities coming up to make sure that uh, the future is equal for all women and girls in Europe. Uh, Catriona, uh, you also, I guess, you talked about shelters for the homeless, for asylum seekers as well? Absolutely. I think it's been really crucial that we have additional supports provided to existing services to make sure that these shelters can stay open and that they can adapt to be able to safely provide space for all of those who are in need of support at this time. We know that homeless persons, women and girls affected by prostitution, undocumented migrant people are particularly at risk and that there is a limitation to their access to these services at this time. So we really need to have adequate resourcing in the longer term for all of these kinds of shelters so that they can safely provide accommodation um, adhering to accommodation regulations in the context of the pandemic. 
Uh, look, thank you very much. So can I go to, back to Zita, and Zita, ask you, uh, I'd like to ask you about Workshop 3, your reaction to that discussion. Just one second, because I just uh, jumped uh, back. Okay, uh, I would say uh, eliminating inequalities and promoting access to services. Of course, this is really something which is absolutely crucial. And uh, I can tell you that if we, if we cannot uh, close these inequalities, especially in this sector, then, of course, it is going to be a, an absolutely uh, serious uh, headache for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for all of us. And, and of course, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, just uh, go back uh, for, a, for a second. Why is it, uh, why is it uh, so important? Because, um, and that is why uh, the, the European Women's Lobby uh, work is, is, is uh, so crucial on, uh, on, on that field. Because I strongly believe that we need to, we need to build allies uh, to overcome all type of, uh, all type of uh, uh, discrimination. And of course, to give equal access uh, for, uh, for services. It's also a question still in our member states. So that's why I strongly believe what is pretty important, even the healthcare is not uh, an EU competence, that during this crisis, it really showed how important to, 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 to get together and, and to and to overcome uh, of this uh, of this awful uh, crisis. So this is the comment that I just wanted to make. Okay, very good, Helen. Let me ask you too, because uh, because Catriona was talking about on, on reproductive rights. There has been progress in some countries. About, it's interesting about the teleconsultations, especially during the during the the COVID crisis, uh, that was seen as an opportunity. Uh, to to expand on on healthcare in that sense, but in other countries they've actually turned the clock back. Uh, what uh, what can the uh, European Parliament here do about that? About trying to ensure that that this care uh, is is available for everybody, all Europeans. Yes. That's, that's not an easy question yeah. because uh, we need, I think it's a very important that we need to further cooperate and, and to uh, learn from each other, of course. Uh, but I also think that we need uh, to have uh, tools. When I listen to this, uh, this seminar, it's a very important seminar about safety for women. Yes. Um, and I can see in this situation uh, we are when women are hit harder. Uh, for example, this concrete example with a health line, uh, yeah. it, it's a good example. We, we need to, uh, to push for, for this uh, quite easy examples. We can do it in, in every member state. Um, I, also, I will also underline that the, for the safety for women uh, in, in, uh, in uh, violence and in domestic violence, it's important how the the society handle it because if the women uh, if the woman uh, will uh, will say will say to the society and, and uh, uh, talk with the police they must meet uh, an, an um, a police that understand the situation mm -hmm. because we need and that, that's why we need education in, in our systems because otherwise uh, she uh, she uh, risks so much when when uh, she wants help mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's important then I, I will of course also uh, make uh, remarks on uh, the, the sexual violence yes because there I'm very critical to the member states in the European Union because we know from our experience in Sweden that when we have a law that criminalizes uh, the, the buyers, the men who want to buy a body uh, for, for sexual interest, mm. when we do that, we can also reach result, and we have a clear result in Sweden. Right. Uh, we have still problems, of course, with prostitution, yeah. but we can see directly results from from this law mm. so i will take this opportunity and say to all the member states do it otherwise uh, i think it's important that we have a law mm. on the european level 
Yes, let, let me, uh, yes, Mark, go ahead, and I want to go to Evelyn after that. Please, Mark. It, it was so interesting also to listen to Catriona, and I'm sure they had very passionate debates, and I would like to mm. come to a few um, uh, points she mentioned, okay. the health services and health practices. This is also very important for LGBTI people, and we are fighting here in the European Parliament to ban the so-called conversion therapies. Mm. This is something which is very bad for the psychological and mental health. We are fighting, and also in this resolution, we are voting next week, we are making aware of that too many intersex babies and children are operated against against their will. Mm -hmm. If there is no medical use, they are being assigned into a into a, 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 a boy or a girl, and yeah. you should leave that up. So these are very important points where you know uh, sexual health and reproductive health goes beyond uh, uh, the question of uh, the rights of, of women. It it's, it it includes all also the LGBTI right. persons. And but they I, not be left behind either. Yes, and uh, leaving right. no one behind is such an important concept. For example, uh, um, prostitution was talked. And here again, victims of, of, of human trafficking. We should not forget them. Yes. The majority are women. So all these aspects are very, very, very important. I'm an AIDS activist too, and um, I'm working in a project in Luxembourg for women who are drug addicts and who are HIV positive and who are homeless. And often they cannot, you know, being HIV positive nowadays, there's treatments and you, you, you can live a normal life. Right. But if you need, if you take your treatment, so you have to provide services for people. And for example, we're trying now to, to create a home for, um, uh, so that these women are not homeless anymore. They can get uh, a therapy to get rid of their drug addiction and they can be, ha have a proper uh, HIV treatment. Mm -hmm. So it it's very important that you really go into the vulnerable groups and leave no one behind. Okay, uh, Maria Neuchel, uh, you wanted to add to that, please. Yes, I'd also like to talk about prostitution. Now, if we want to help people across Europe, then it needs to have the same basis. When you're talking about prostitution, and I think about my own member state, people talk about sex work as if it was some kind of normal service sector job. Other people talk about uh, violence and the violation of human rights in the same context. Well, what we need is a unified, harmonized definition. Prostitution has got nothing to do with sex work. Prostitution is a form of violence and it's ex an expression of sexual violence. And it has to be clear across all member states. And that will also help the care structures that can help these women. If you get out of uh, prostitution. It's like trying to get out of a spider's net. Women uh, get stuck there. Sometimes it's uh, physical pressure, threats, drugs, fear. It's trying to get out of a spider's web where you're stuck. It's a difficult job and I hope that my own member state, Germany, will finally move away from its liberal sex market and starts to understand that prostitution is a breach of human rights. Maria, thank you very much. Uh, let me go to Evelyn Regner. Uh, as the chair of the FEM committee, it seems to me that this workshop kind of threw the gauntlet down and said, it's up, it, the MEP's role is very important. I think the buck stops there. I think how much can the MEP's play a role in, in advancing these, uh, these issues and leaving no one behind? I think we in the European Parliament are really pushing the issues. I just take Poland, for example, but also uh, other, uh, other issues. The right to decide over your own body. This is so crucial that we in the European Parliament were always very quick. We had recently a hearing uh, on, uh, on, the, on, um, on abortion and what's going on in Poland in in the parliament and I think with this we push also our solidarity with men both and women who are fighting for their rights and when it's the decision over your body when it's the decision what what are you doing so somehow uh, we really have to show the solidarity in, in, in the parliament and we did it a lot so also with uh, oral question with the debate in the, in the plenary in this case Many of these um, 
uh, national legislations are always saying, ah, this is a question of subsidiarity with this in our country. So whether it uh, be, uh, if it is right now, the access to health services, to all sort of SRHR, or the strong issue on, on, on abortion. And it's clear that we must show this solidarity and not leave uh, people behind. And with this, we also signal when you touch these basic access rights, yeah, then you touch not only the rights of people, in, of women in Poland or in other countries, you just do that with all of us in Europe. So we, uh, we, we there is a so such a strong solidarity and therefore it's important that when they get public, again and again, use it also to say uh, the European Union is a union of core values which are enshrined in the treaty. And there are some so many international conventions also heard in this regard. And therefore we strengthen them all together, all women uh, uh, over Europe. This publicity we're doing in European Parliament with our work is so important because it strengthens all those going in the streets, striking, being so fantastic and really showing resistance. Uh, and uh, I just can tell you also in all these debates we have right now around the 8th of March, uh, these rights, the right to decide over my body, the right to abortion, the right to SRHR, are always the most important issues that unite really women all over here. When we are debating, there are so many issues, but it always starts with yourself. You, we all women have to feel free, to have to feel safe. And when there is a society, also a neoliberal society, and I'm going to the topic of prostitution over, that decides that you are, the body is a marketplace or that the body is a, a battlefield of ideology, things are going wrong. And therefore, the European Parliament stands for that, uh, 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 sa uh, this safe space, this safe area around women's right to self-determination over herself. Okay, Helen, uh, um, what comes to mind, I'm sorry, um, no, 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 I'm sorry, Evelyn, Evelyn. The other thing that comes to mind is that you're head of the FEM committee. But some of these issues cross over into other committees, like uh, like Libe, like you know it, it, Justice and Home Affairs, on this question of, and this I thought was quite striking, what Catriona was talking about uh, gender-based violence, and that uh, in in one place the, the police mm -hmm. tell the man uh, about about the woman uh, about the victim and and the dangers there. What can what can we do on a European level about law enforcement regarding uh, sexual violence? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're working very closely together with the Libby Committee, and uh, I can really say, fortunately, this is a very fruitful and excellent, uh, really a, a fantastic cooperation. So we are, uh, we always, I mean, agreeing and really push the uh, things jointly together. Um, we are demanding that there is um, a new uh, Eurocrime uh, introduced. Uh, a Euro crime, an article that says um, violence against women, that's crime as such. And there is a European responsibility. That means when we do that, we can also compare facts and figures. Because it's always uh, the, the most important story in beginning to know what is happening. Uh, many, in many countries, in many legislations, this sort of violence is private, it is pushed back. And so somehow the, the, the state is uh, uh, withdrawing to interfere, though of course there's a huge responsibility in order to go for that. And therefore it's important that we are just uh, getting the situation that we are able to compare this gender-based violence in Bulgaria with the gender uh, violence in uh, Ireland and uh, in Italy. We see societies are dealing in a different way with these sort of crimes. It's very important, spot on that, introduce a new, uh, 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 a new definition of a Euro crime. Uh, Zita, Zita, let me ask you, uh, on, on, from a national level, you as a member of the Hungarian parliament, how much do you look, do you look to the European parliament and the European Union uh, in, in helping to deal with uh, gender-based violence from a law enforcement aspect? Is that possible? 
Uh, honestly speaking, uh, this is a parliament in which uh, we have no committee which deals with women rights and gender equality ah. because, the current, uh, because the current parliament uh, does not, uh, or actually the president of the parliament or the prime minister, does not believe that it is important. But as I told Indeed. you... We, we yeah, are that's in a, why, we are that's in why I'm asking you. I'm asking you, because perhaps there might not be as much action on the national level there in your, in your case, how much can you perhaps rely or, or, or look to uh, Brussels in, in helping deal with that? Honestly speaking, we are on an ongoing dialogue with, with Evelyn Regner from, uh, from the National Parliament or Maria Neukel or, or uh, my great friend Helen Fritzson, which means that, of course, we are always informing what is going on. But the problem is that uh, what we can do uh, within the Parliament frame uh, to, to speak on the plenary or just to ask uh, questions or just to do resolution like we did the equal pay for equal work uh, or, uh, or uh, young fathers could stay uh, 10 days at home instead of five, which is the case in Hungary. And the government said that uh, we do it only in one year time. So they simply don't care about women. So they, so they just have their own uh, populist policy in which women uh, are in Kinderküchekirchen. So it is still the very 19th century uh, rhetoric. So that's why what we can do, uh, sometimes we try to act together with the women in opposition and, and, and try to achieve good things. That's what we did during the, 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 the 25th of November. That's what we try to do 8th of March. But of course, COVID-19 does not help too much because we lose yes. the street. And as Orban just announced uh, this morning uh, that uh, we cannot organize any event since 8th of March, because uh, 8th of March is, of course, a very crucial day for us, it is clear that Orban has a fear from women, sorry to say. Uh-huh. Okay. Let, let me go to Mark, um, and let's extend that to the LGBTI mm -hmm. issue on law enforcement and gender-based mm -hmm. violence. Well, what Evelyn said about enlarging the list of Euro crimes is out most important. And yes. here, the LGBTI uh, equality strategy presented by um, uh, Helena Dali and also uh, the president of the commission is backing this. Uh, the, also, the, the, the crime, hate speech and hate crime against LGBTI people will be included in that list. And I think that's mm. a very important step forward. But let me come back to prostitution. I can only underline what Helen and Maria said, and I'm totally on their line. But I also think next to the discussion of uh, prostitution, we have to have a, a good discussion on sexuality. You know, sex, sex is not a taboo. We have to talk about sexuality. And here education yeah, comes in. Yeah, that's the in. education side, Education right. comes in. Yeah. And, um, and in, in, an, in a world where sex is so omnipresent uh, everywhere, um, I think it's, it's very important, sexual education. And in French, there is such a nice word I promoted, education sexuelle affective. Mm. It's not only, it's all also about love, about, about, yes. about uh, yeah, affections and, and emotions mm. uh, which mm. go along. And I think we should have an open discussion also about sexuality. Sex is not a taboo, it's a natural thing, it's, it's fun, it's good. And, 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 and because some religion backgrounds, you know, that there is always this taboo and we should be more open about it and especially educate uh, people. And, 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 and sex, is, sex mm -hmm. is, is combined with love is, is the best sex anyway. That's worth a hashtag, I would say. Um, Helen, final word before we... Uh wrap up with uh, Madame Neuchel. Okay. I just remember because uh, a few years ago in Sweden we had a campaign for, uh, for small kids uh, uh, about their right to their own body. And in Sweden they learned to say uh, in Swedish, uh, stop min kop, and that means stop my body. So mm. small children, uh, mm. when, uh, when um, uh, we want to, to uh, uh, have them in our knee, they can say, stop my body <laughs> uh, and that's that's good because yeah. that's what what mark uh, spoke about we we must be proud of what we are yeah. um, but i think uh, the first most important step for uh, against trafficking and um, uh, the the sexual violence and the crime is that we agree that it is a crime mm -hmm. Uh, and that's a good start because uh, we don't have the situation in all the countries. And 
Uh, another good example was when we had the process about the budget and the recovery fund. And we said from our political family that Hungary, for example, when they discussed uh, abortion mm -hmm. and uh, uh, behind the crisis, um, we said, uh, you will have no money if you don't uh, follow the rule of law. Uh, and in the rule of law, uh, it is a human right. Uh, women's rights are human rights. And, and we must push for that because all the countries, uh, even <laughs> all the countries in the European Union are interested of the common money. So yes. uh, money talks and it, it, we must use uh, this opportunity to have a, a, a push for uh, democracy, rule of law, uh, rights, human rights, and women's rights. Helen, thank you very much. Helen Fritzson, S&D Group Vice President, uh, and to Marc Angel, Angel uh, the uh, co-president of the European <laughs> Parliament's LGBTI intergroup. Thank you so much for being with me. En chair et en os, as they would say in French. Uh, and, and, and to all of the other speakers, uh, and those of you who have sent in your questions, thank you so much for joining us on this. And uh, I'd like to get some final remarks from Maria Neuchel, S&D coordinator for the uh, FEM committee. Um, you know, as a European citizen, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be part of this beautiful and sometimes problematic mosaic called the European Union and trying to, as we were talking about, getting common uh, values and ways to uh, deal uh, with uh, gender equality. It's not an easy thing, is it, Maria? Ah, I think you need to turn uh, your mic on. Microphone. Yeah, I glaube ich bin jetzt jetzt hören. Can you hear me now? I would like to warmly thank all our speakers and you as moderator. You have definitely steered us through a very diverse debate. I feel it is important to underscore the fact that the EU, Europe, is a promise, a pledge to women. This promise has made it clear during the pandemic that we need to do better, do better when it comes to domestic violence, when it comes to the way we value so-called typical women's jobs. We need to show our esteem through appropriate payment, not just applause. We need to show we value the work done by ensuring proper pay for jobs well done. Men and women all need to understand that equality is important for everyone, men and women. We need to do better when it comes to the role models, the images we pass on to our young people. What is typically male, typically female? These images and perceptions uh, make such a difference to gender equality. When we talk about what's typically male, typically female, that can have a real impact. Now I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone and by sharing an idea. Can we have democracy without equality, gender equality? We'd uh, had debate in Europe for years as to whether there should be a vote for women. And I think it is crystal clear that you can't have democracy if only part of society can vote. So now is the time to make it crystal clear that we cannot have democracy without equality. These are inextricably bound. We see that in those countries where democracy is under attack. This is the first step in attempts to destroy democracy. We see that in Hungary and Poland. We see that women's rights are being eroded, that the rights of minorities are being eroded. That is the first sign of democracy being destroyed. We see the rights of women and minorities being eroded. So I would appeal to young people, let us pull together, work together for a more democratic Europe if we truly build democracy, then we will ensure gender equality. 
We cannot allow dem uh, equality to flourish without democracy. Now, I'd like to thank everyone. Helen Fritzen, Evelyn Regner, Iracha, our uh, two male colleagues who uh, contributed uh, bravely to the discussion. And I'd also like to thank all of you at home uh, following us, perhaps on your mobile phones, on your settees, uh, all around Europe. We fight for democracy when we fight for equality and we need to do that every day from dawn to dusk so thank you very much and warmest greetings from brussels thank you very much uh, maria um, our thanks to uh, all of those who participated uh, uh, to the young european socialist the friedrich ebert uh, stiftung uh, PES Women, uh, Europeans Women's Lobby, and uh, FEPS, the Foundation for European Progressive uh, Studies, uh, on being a part of this uh, Progressive Youth Forum. Thank you so much. As we look ahead to uh, International Women's Day next week, these were very important issues to cover and we'll be continuing to discuss. And also, uh, if you uh, think of anything from this event to, to hashtag, include the hashtag to tweet, include the hashtag IWD, and uh, hashtag Youth for Equality. Thanks very much, so much for joining us, and see you next time.